What's the most important thing that you've learned so far in life? The most important thing is really, and it's going to sound hackneyed, but it's all about the people, okay? Because if you can't get the right people in place to 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 build your organization, you're never going to be able to make it happen. And the other thing too is don't be afraid to make a change, all right? So so it's really to me it's 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 really it's really about assembling the right team and not being afraid to make the changes you need to make that happen. So you've been involved in restructuring and retail for a long time. What's the hardest thing about restructuring that you've faced? Well, I think in terms of of my many years of going into companies that are stressed and troubled, the the hardest thing is, is really uh, um, really being able to evaluate uh, the the chances of success of the company. So that's the number one thing you have to do because you have to say to yourself, realistically, can you restructure a company? Can you uh, turn it around or not? So that's number one. And that's tough because you have to do it and you have to do it quickly. And you have to get a game plan together um, once you've done that to to move forward. How long does it normally take to make that decision, whether it's it's something that can be saved or not? Well, it all depends on uh, it, it. It could be a matter. It could be a week. It could be longer, depending on the company's financial position. So if you've got if a company is up against the wall and they're running out of money, then you've got to make decisions quickly based on information that may not be perfect. Uh, if you've got the if you if you've got the luxury of uh, being able to operate the company for a while, then you know you try to re- you try to use that time to really dig in and and uh, have a have a a plan that is you, you know. Uh, much more uh, fulsome and attacks all aspects of the business. But if a company is is really out of money or about to be out of money, then you've got to you've got to triage it, right? You've got to get in there and you've got to say, okay, uh, the most important thing is is to keep it going. And so you're going to make some quick decisions in that regard, and you're going to look at what the levers are that you can pull to do that. I love that you said that that word lever. I've I've never been responsible for like a restructuring, but I did help several small companies. They were doing less than a million dollars a year in revenue um, to figure out how to kind of fix their problems and regrow you know, and start to grow again. Right. And for example, with my dad's business, I found that there was this one thing that he was doing that was really holding him back, and that was his his liquidity sucked because the fact that they were doing paper claims for their insurance uh, insurances because he was a dentist. Right. And I found that by switching to the electronic claim system that was embedded in their software, we were able to cut it down from 60 days to get money back to six days. And so the liquidity problem went away. And it was just one thing that I did, right. but it took me like two weeks to, to go through everything to figure out, ah, this is the thing that I can do, the easiest thing I can do with right. the highest result. So how do you discover or how do you let that information surface what that lever should be well i mean when when you've been doing this for a long time all right what you learn is with all these companies whether it's a whether your back is up against the wall or you know you have time to come up with a with a a, a much more um you know comprehensive turnaround plan liquidity is number one so that because basically if you don't have sufficient liquidity to buy you the time to fix the company, you, you know, you can have the greatest team in the world. You can have a great plan, but you won't be able to you make it happen. So that's a, that's really the first thing uh, we at, uh, I attack. And, at, you know, in my role at, at Getzler Henrik, which is a financial restructuring firm, and in my experience working with companies, the first thing you really want to do is do what we call a 13-week cash flow. All right. We want to look at, uh, at at sources of funds and expenses and and figure out whether, you know, what what the pain points are to attack that. And then when you look at that and you see, you know, when you're going to be running out of cash, which of, often happens or you're stressed, then you you say, OK, 
I've got to pull these levers to do it. Am I not going to, am I going to stretch my payables? Am I going to uh, draw down on my credit line? Am I going to um, look at, at reducing expenses, reducing headcount, all those different things? And there's lots of, again, as we were talking about the levers, there's lots of levers, more than people think in terms of being able to access liquidity. So, and you know, every company and every situation is different. So you have to look at that, you know, uh, 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 accordingly and, and tailor that to the situation. But, you know, the usual that, that the, the, the issues are usually um, uh, pretty much the same from company to company. It's just a question of the, de- the degree. So I recently interviewed someone who uh, had three million dollars in debt for his business. And he realized that if he could just convince his customers to pay him up front, that he would get out of his problem. And so he went to one of his biggest customers who was paying him half a million dollars a month postpaid, and he convinced him to do prepaid. Now his business is on track to do 70 million in revenue this year from 3 million. Right. right. Just because one right. thing. And it was just, right. It, but, but that was one thing that made all the difference, right? That changed the trajectory of his business. I mean, I had a situation many years ago where I was running a company in San Francisco and they were totally out of cash. They'd drawn down on their bank loan. The bank really wanted to foreclose, but they, they didn't want to do it because it was a very high profile business and they didn't want to be accused of, of putting the company into liquidation. And the key to the success of this business, which was a very high-end specialty retailer, was flow of goods, right? And nobody was shipping because the, the the CEO and founder of the company, you know, was was wouldn't reach out to the vendor community to tell him he needed help, right? And so basically what we looked at is we said, okay, the only way this is going to work is if we get the vendors to um, to give us more leeway on payables and also agree to ship. So we came up with a construct and we said, okay, uh, and and this was a very special company and uh, he had long relationships with the vendors, you know, all designer, super high-end companies and many of whom he had introduced to the American market. So, you know, after after calling all of them and having having them yell at me, all right, uh, so that they could vent and, and they, they, you know, and, and I could apologize for our lack of communication. We came together. We came up to, we came with them to a plan and said, you know, if you want this company to go out of business, that's fine, but you're not going to have this company to sell to. And it's an important resource for you. If you want to, if you want to make it work, Here's our proposal. Our proposal is to, to do a, a one year standstill on all outstanding debt, most of which was a year old. OK, which is kind of unheard of. And um, we can we can, uh, uh, you know, we'd like you to resume the flow of goods and we'll pay you 50 percent up front. And then we'll pay you every week based on on what was sold by by item and we could track that on our computer systems and then at the end of six months we'll true up whatever we owe you and we were able to get them to to agree to that because they wanted to support the company and and that gave us bought us enough time to have fresh goods in to get the customers back and to eventually sell the company so you know it's like each situation is like you've got to you've got to figure out what what levers to pull to pull to to keep it going so that you can again it's all about buying the time to fix the company it sounds like in the situation you were talking about it was a pretty pretty easy fix right that that uh, uh that was you know you, you were able to turn that switch on and that made all the difference um most companies it's a lot more complicated than that so um uh so you, you, and you try and you what you have to do is you've got to put together a plan right and a bunch of initiatives, and you can usually you can't do more than four or five things at the same time and get the organization to do it. You've got to really narrow it and say, okay, here's the eighty percent. I call it the eighty percent solution. Here's the four or five things we need to do to get eighty percent of the way there, and all the other to dos, all right, are are nice to have but not essential. And so, and that, and when you can 
when you can when you can identify what those initiatives are and you get the organization and the stakeholders and there are many stakeholders and turnarounds right behind you you can you can make it work so yeah with the with my dad's business i i tried to do many things but when i realized that that was the most important one i had to tell everyone from the team like look we're not doing paper claims anymore. This is how we have to do it. I had to train them all. I had to work with them on it multiple times because there were, it's software, you know, right. there's p- parts, parts of it they didn't understand. There were also, I was 25. A lot of them were in their fifties that were working the software. So I had to go slow with them. And it took, it took a month or so at least to get them to be like, okay, I got it. I understand. Right. I'm not going to do paper claims anymore. Um, and all that. I, I think for the other guy I was talking about that I interviewed with his business, he, uh, the one who was 3 million in debt, you said that um, it's typically uh, a simple fix, but at the same time, he may not have either thought to do that, or maybe he was afraid that they wouldn't want to support him, or maybe he was afraid of telling them the truth that their business was having financial problems. And so I think it's really important what you said after that, which was, you have to be willing to be, look, I'm sorry. Like we're trying right. to fix this. You know, we made mistakes. We're sorry that this, you know, the previous CEO didn't do his job very well, but we're here now we're trying to fix it. And, and hopefully we can maintain good relationship. And, and, you know, people respond to that because, you know, it's like, all right, here's the bad news. All right. And, and here's the good news. All right. And we, and we need your help. And when you pe- tell people, most people, we need your help. All right. They usually respond because they appreciate the honesty and the fact that you're in a partnership. Right. You've got all these partnerships with all different stakeholders. And when you do that, uh, you'll get usually a good response. If if they believe that the, the the company has a sustainable business proposition. All right. Because they have to believe that, that there's a co- there's a go forward company here. If they don't think so, then they're not going to do it. I mean, when you look at what happened at Bed Bath and Beyond, you know, the vendor community basically said, you know what, you, you know, you got you got rid of all of us. You went to private label, and now you want us to come back. And you know, we've already we've already readjusted our business, and you know, we're not going to give you credit. We're not going to do the things that you know you would you want because we we don't believe that this thing is going to fly. So, and and that's unfortunate, you know, it's really unfortunate because it was a fabulous business for so many years. I think one of Bed Bath & Beyond's death knells was their 20% off coupon all the time. Uh, Well, my my mom lived by it. I know. I know. And maybe it was their way of getting people in the door, but or or maybe maybe they were overpricing their products so that the 20% off actually didn't cut into their profits. Maybe they were, they were clearly still profitable for a time until they started making mistakes. Yeah, well, the problem with Bed Bath & Beyond, unfortunately, was that they had a very specific business model. And people came to Bed Bath & Beyond because they were, you know, they were a category killer, right? They had huge assortments of branded merchandise. And an activist investor got involved, uh, changed the whole board. And, and believe me, they weren't doing they weren't gr- doing great uh, at, at that point in time. But they, they, you know, they were they were doing OK, but they you know, it was a public company. So obviously the scrutiny was very different than if you're a private company. Uh, and and so, you know, he was able to completely change out the board and they brought in a, 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 a very talented merchant from Target. But his strategy was was that we're going to basically get rid of all the brands and we're going to do all private label programs, which is not what people came to Bed Bath & Beyond for. They came to Bed Bath & Beyond because if you wanted cookware, cookware, they had all clad, they had Calphalon, they had, you know, the brands that they wanted at at decent prices. And, you know, the, look, the 20% coupon was, was kind of like, it was kind of like a drug addition, addiction. However, and it was. And but th- what they realized is when they when they tried getting rid of it, that you know, that was a disaster. Uh, and so the, but the 20 percent off coupon was was really 20 percent off on one item. All right. 
And the idea was you're going to buy more than that. But what happened is if you shopped in the store, you go to the register and the cashiers would give you 20 percent off on the whole damn order. And if you didn't have a coupon, they give you a coupon. So and par- so part of that is is really making sure that your associates, you know, are are executing the program correctly and not giving it away. So, you know, and and and. Th- those those are those are problematic issues, you know, when you when you're dependent on that. But they made a lot of money with those 20 percent off coupons for a lot of years. And also the Bed Bath and Beyond situation was that, you know, they had a CEO who had been there for many years and, you know, they they didn't really evolve. And the merchandise itself was not as, you know, as as on trend as it used to be. So it's a combination of a lot of things that got together and then they changed their, their strategy and they changed their strategy without testing it. So they had like a thousand stores. They could have, you know, they could have taken 50 stores and tried it this way to see whether it would work or not. And, you know, that's the same situation that happened. I don't know if you remember J.C. Penney many years ago where they brought in a new CEO had come from Apple and he changed the whole strategy of the company. And it was the, the strategy, J.C. Penney's strategy was they had a circular every week. Everything was, on, you know, everything was on sale and whether it was on sale or not, you know, and that's what brought the customers in. And he decided to go to, for everyday low pricing. And it's my experience is there has never been a company that has gone from high low pricing to everyday low pricing that that succeeded. You know, it's a really tough thing to once you've trained your customers for decades to do that, to all of a sudden, uh, you know, put down a light switch and say, oh, we're going to do it this way now. And the customers are saying, well, that's that's not what we expect. Right. So, you know, that that it, it's amazing. Again, you're talking about doing doing one big thing that can really can can really hurt your company. And it did. You know, they almost didn't survive. That reminds me of Costco's CEO pledging to never raise the hot dog above a dollar fifty, even if they lose money. Yeah, and and you know what, they can afford to do it because they're 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 on, on their hand. You know, Costco Costco's delivers on their promises, right? They mark it up. I don't know, fifteen or seventeen percent above cost, and you know that and and they are great merchants. So when you go into when you go into Costco, right, and you've got your little shopping list of what you need, you invariably uh, uh, leave spending a lot more money than than you expected to because, you know, uh, they they have great they have great stuff and great deals and you know people can't help themselves, right? They they see it and they they go ahead and do it. So the you know the basket is is bigger uh, than what their shopping the, your your shopping list was, and. You know, and the quality of the product is fabulous. So uh, they really deliver. And just the way they run, you know, it's such a well-run company. And the other thing about Costco that's really, really interesting, um, which I think is really important today, is they really they really respect their employees. And they tr- they pay them better than the competition. They treat them better. You know, Costco is closed on the major holidays because they feel that their that their associates should be home with, you know, with their families on Thanksgiving and, you know, Memorial Day and July 4th. And the result is, is that they have very, very low turnover. They have the, 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 the staff, you know, loves the company and the productivity is there. When you go in there, everybody's really helpful. Everybody's happy to be there. You know, they get you in and out fast. They, you know, they, they do it all. And uh, uh, it's, it's a great, it's a great lesson on how important, you know, don't forget the people that work for you. Okay. Treat them with respect, pay them fairly. And they'll, you know, they'll stick with you and they'll go the extra mile. I think they pay for people's college degrees. Yeah, they may do that too. I mean, that all I can tell you is, is that, we, we've been shopping at Costco for years, and no matter where you go, the experience is pretty much the same. And the 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 the, the staff is really helpful, and you know, and they're efficient. And the shelves are always stocked. You know, they they execute against the basics so well. 
But it also starts with the merchandise, right? They've got great merchandise uh, and they get great deals. So it's like, and consumers today, you know, you know, that's what they expect, right? Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far, and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work. And every week we bring you a new guest and a new story. And what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment, it's free to do. And if you don't like what we're doing later on, you can always unsubscribe. And either way, we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time. Thank you very much and we'll take you back to the show now. Yeah, I remember watching a video on YouTube about Costco and I believe they they don't care about the pricing on each product because they make the bulk of their profit from the membership. Right. I think they make about I think they made 4 or 5 billion dollars last year just from the membership right. profit. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So and so the, basically and the other thing too about their model is is that the velocity of their sales is fantastic. So basically it gets on the shelf and is sold probably most of the time before they have to pay the vendor. So that so from a cash flow perspective, it's it's an incredible thing. And and because they have so much, you know, so much traffic into their stores and they sell the stuff so quickly, you know, uh, they're they're able to do that. So it's a very different model. And but it, but it really, you know, tapped into uh, uh, what consumers really value and delivering on the, on their promise. So what's a company that you were tasked with restructuring your your um, modeling says it was possible and it failed anyways and and why do you think it failed oh okay well i i can't uh, there was a, a very famous uh and i wasn't the ceo of this company but i was on the board and i was very actively involved and um it was a very well-known name in retailing. It had been around for a hundred years. They were one of the first uh, uh, apparel discounters. And um, they had been through bankruptcy twice before. But the, but the business itself was unique and customers loved it. And a couple of things happened. Once was when they went through the second bankruptcy, they were acquired by a private equity firm, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? But... Um, uh, because they really understood the retail business and I had been involved with them with other, with, you know, with other situations that were very successful. And what happened was number one, they had too many stores when they, when they went through the second bankruptcy, they didn't close enough of the underperforming stores. That's number one. Number two, and most important was they brought in a new team, uh, a management team that was just the wrong team. And they basically drove the business into the ground. And when I got there, I had, I went to, to, you know, the owners and I said, you need to hire these people and bring in people who can make it work. Okay. They just, they, you know, and they, they, they just didn't get it. And so, so we didn't have the right team. And if you don't have the right team, you're not going to be able to affect the turnaround. All right. And so you had a you had a situation where you had too many stores that were not productive, but more than that, you had a team that just didn't understand the business and how to to resuscitate it. And um, and and so unfortunately, uh, it was a you know it was a tough retail period as well. And so you know the the, the owner ran out of you know ran out of patience. And so. You, you know, and that's what happens very often. It's like, well, am I going to, the company's continuing not to perform and am I going to put more money in or am I just going to, you know, liquidate it and, and, you know, that's it. And that's what happened. And it was, it was really very sad because there are still many, many customers today that remember that custom, that, that business, uh, you know, high end designer apparel discounted. And I'm really, you know, and, you know, there's no place else that's doing it. So that was kind of a shame, you know, because because it was a good business and they could have 
you know, it could have been it, it, it could have been resuscitated with the right management team. So if it seems like such a golden goose, why not start it from scratch yourself? Because, be, well, because the cost of doing it, the locations, the investment, you, you wouldn't get anybody to, to, to do it. OK, because, you know, they they were the original off pricer and you've got so many other people now like, you know, TJ Maxx and Burlington and whatever, even though they don't go up as high. All right. Uh, you know, there. And believe me, when things were getting tough, uh, we you know, we went to them and said, you know, would you consider buying it? And the business wasn't big enough for it to be important enough for them to do it. And they said, you know, you know. Unless it's a billion dollar business, we're really not interested. So, you know, and, and also timing is important too. It was a, it was a rough time for retail. And so people were not of a mind to, to, you know, to invest or do a, a transaction. So a lot of these things are, are, um, uh, uh, you know, are timing related as well. What's a company that you're, Modeling said could not be saved, and you said screw it, let's do it anyways, and you succeeded. Oh no, 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 that doesn't work that way. If no. I believe, <laughs> if I believe, if I do the analysis, and I say that you know that there's that you know there's there's it's funny in in the business is kind of like the 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 thing is is that if this company went out of business tomorrow, would anybody care? And if the answer is no then it's not a keeper. The other thing too is, for example, I was involved with a company years ago, many years ago, uh, uh, and um, my client was, you know, a, a distressed debt fund that was basically owned the, 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 the company that did the photo studios in Walmart, okay? And-, and I think it's one hour photo. Well, no, it's it's no, they, it's not one of a photo. They were photo studios. And if you had kids that were in school and you had, you know, parents used to do this. They used to do it at, at Sears, at Walmart. Um, and there were other individual photo studios that did it where you would, you know, you would take your kids in when they were infants. You know, you do there'd be family occasions where you take photos, stuff like that it was a big deal. All right. And Walmart had hundreds of them. This company was and at one time it was very successful because you couldn't get a professional uh, photograph, which was very important. You see, there's a photograph on the wall behind you there. You know, uh, uh, it's like those pose photos, you know, parents love that. OK. And so uh, it, it was a great business for a long time. And then what happened? What happened is digital photography came in. Right. So you were able to take photographs and have them printed, you know, that were good enough. Right. That you weren't going to pay that amount of money to do it. And, you know, that was a business that was not going to, you know, uh, succeed. And we were lucky enough at that point in time that our biggest competitor uh, wanted to buy the business. And so at the time, you know, we were talking about it and I'd say, get out, get your money back. And they did. And that was and of course, uh, you know, and they were the people that did it. At, you know, that did the Sears one. And that ended up being you know, a, a liquidation. So, so from that perspective, it's kind of, you got to know when to, when, you know, when to get out as well, or say, you know, it, you're, you're better off to liquidate for the benefit of your creditors than to continue to put more money in. And that what's happened is, I don't know if you even remember this, but there was a whole um, channel of retail called, um, uh, um, oh gosh, um, catalog showrooms. Did you ever hear of catalog showrooms? Uh, maybe I, I think I know what you're talking about, but then the word is is not. Uh, well, catalog uh, showrooms were, and they were one of the first discounters too. So you'd go into these stores, and you'd see one of each item, and you know you, they you, they get it from you in from the back, okay, and you pay for it, and you get a discount, and that was good. Well, that was good until the big box retailers and the discounters came into business, and they and they basically. You know, it was it was a concept that was no longer valid. All right. Uh, in that regard, because customers preferred to go to the Costco's and the Burlington's and the TJ Maxx's of the world, et cetera. Um, so so that's what happened. You know, retail 
as a continual change. It's always changing and evolving. You know, you have to remember that, you know, before Saul Price started what, what they call Price Club, which became Costco, that, that you know, he invented that concept of, cl- of, uh, of clubs, which resonated and still does resonate with consumers. So without sharing any sort of proprietary information or insider knowledge, obviously, because that would be bad. What's a retail company that exists today that you feel highly confidently is going to go out of business in the next few years? Oh, why? that's, 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 I would say, I, 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 I wouldn't, I would say that you're going to see a lot of direct to consumer uh, um, uh, companies go out of business a lot because the model like a Best Buy. No, Best Buy is no. I think Best Buy is good because see, Best Buy is good because they're the last man standing. And in the electronics business, all right, people still want to go into stores and and see the product and also have help, have qualified help that can help them make their decisions. And I think they, you know, they were in on the rocks. At one point in time, and then they brought in a new president, a CEO, and he did a fabulous job turning it around. And you know, the thing about about these companies are, you know, they were doing gangbusters during COVID, right? And then, and because people were buying big ticket items for their homes and stuff like that, and now, you know, they're suffering. They're suffering to some degree, but now it's starting to come back. So Best Buy, it's a well managed company. You know, and they'll be fine. You know, they'll be fine. I think, you know, if if it weren't, for example, if it weren't for the fact that J.C. Penney is owned by Simon and Brookfield, who are big mall operators, they would have gone out of business. But they they've they've stayed in business because the mall operators want them in their malls. Because if they lose an anchor, what happens is it it triggers what they call a use clause. And what it means is that they can, the, the specialty uh, retailers, you know, the hundreds of those that are in the mall, you know, the small retailers uh, can go on percentage rent. So, so they're, they're being supported. Pennies is being supported because it supports the, the, the landlord's rent rolls in that regard. But if that hadn't been the case, you know, pennies, there's no reason why they, they, they couldn't have gone out of business. And that's, you know, look, Sears has, Sears has gone out. Um, Kmart's gone out, those types of people. So, and it's an evolving, it's an evolving situation, uh, for sure. Um, but there's always companies that, that again, they lose their way or, you know, that they're, they're kind of selling commoditized products. The companies, the retail companies that are, that are in the sort of the middle, you know, and a lot of those department store companies are there are very vulnerable today. Because what's working with consumers is luxury, of course, because those people always have money and off price or value priced retailers. So, so I think that's what you, what, you know, and so the people that are in the middle, right, where, you know, aspirational customers would rather go up or, or go down and get a better deal. Those are the companies that are going to survive. One company. Okay. One company that I think is very vulnerable is Rite Aid. Okay. The uh, the the drug company. Okay. What? No, they're still there. Okay, and the reason for that that I think that they're going to go out, all right, or be be sold in pieces, is that you know you've already got CVS and Walgreens that do a much better job, and you know they can just they can just t- t- and 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 Rite Aid's been struggling for a long time, so they'll buy their prescription business. And they'll pick up the locations that uh, work for them. And, you know, that'll be that. I, I just don't see them. I don't see them survive because they're like the third wheel. And you've got two strong nationwide, well-run um, uh, competitors. You said CVS and Walgreens? Yeah. Yeah. They, they, you know, they're, they're very well run. They've got a huge footprint, you know, huge prescription businesses. And they're also innovating in terms of wellness and things like that. Of the strip malls and shopping malls that still are open, what do you think is going to replace those big box stores that, that fell apart inside of those, those malls? Well, that's a very interesting question. And that's what a lot of, of, of mall operators are thinking about. All right. 
you're going to see a certain number of the, the A malls and the B plus malls and a, mo a lot of the B malls will be okay. All right. Uh, but even with them, if they lose a big box, they have to decide how they're going to re-merchandise their, their, uh, their properties. And a lot of them are, you know, and they're doing things like, you know, more, um, uh, urgent care facilities, uh, they may be that they're doing they're bringing in a lot more food, a lot more restaurants. Restaurants are are, you know, they they that, that seems to broaden the appeal of, of the malls. Customers really like it. Um, and then, you know, some of the malls that wouldn't bring in a Costco before are bringing in a Costco or, you know, um, you know, not not a what we call full price retailer because they built or a target because they bring in traffic. And they're and they're well run, so they're rethinking, right? What's what's going to make that that property attractive to their to their customers? You know, for some of the lower lower and oh, and also in some of the 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 malls, they're also looking at the amount of property they have, all right? And they're saying, okay, we can we can build condos. You know, we can put in a hotel. We can do all sorts of things with the asset. To you know, improve the return and and also help drive traffic to those to those locations. You know the 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 uh, the A malls and strip centers they're fine. And if anything, what's interesting is that, you know among the better properties, the the occupancy rate is almost higher than it's ever been because everybody wants to be where the where the where their shop you know the shopper is. Yeah, there's a company in Canada that I've invested in uh, at the beginning of the year that does e-commerce liquidation I mentioned to you during our intro call. And they moved from a smaller town on the Vancouver Island, the center of it, to the port area, which is 10 times the population of the town that originally in. And we now have an opportunity to get a space in one of the most busiest malls in the town. And so he's like, hey, I want to do this, but we need like another $20,000 to do that. You know, what do you think? And I'm like, well, let's try to get a loan because it's the only way to make it happen. Yeah, and you want to be where the customers are, right? And and it's what's so interesting is when you look at companies that have you know fleets of stores, the you know you, you know the the top producers are usually in the 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 malls or strips that have great traffic and great traffic with your demographic, okay. That's important. It's got to be aligned with your demographic. Who is your customer? Uh, where do they shop? And are they going to come to you? And so, and you know, there's there's plenty of real estate consultants out there that you can hire to help you understand that, and also help you help you negotiate a good, um, you know, as good a deal as possible in that regard. But very often, what I've seen is that the most profitable stores can also have the highest rent per square foot because, you know, there's a direct relationship between that and, you know, traffic and sales. So normally when someone does consulting, they either get paid a flat fee or maybe some sort of percentage of upside. Um, I know that's what I look for. How does a company that helps other companies restructure generally get paid? Well, it varies. Okay. Some companies just do it on a, uh, an hourly rate, right? Based on hours build. All right. Some do a combination of that and a success fee. So it's, it, it's the, you know, the gamut. Some will also, some will also actually, if they believe in it, they'll say, okay, uh, we'll, we'll do this at X rate, but we want a certain amount of, of, of ups in the equity of the company or they'll do or the, and the success fee thing could be, let's say um, you're going in there to, to improve profitability. They may decide to say uh, I've worked for a company where, where we got a percentage of the upside in savings so that, so we'll, we lower the rate. All right. Because, you know, customers always feel that the rates are too high. And, you know, that's that's a situation where where the proof is in the pudding. Right. You, you don't you don't know whether it's worth it until until you get the results. Right. So sometimes, depending on the situation and the analysis of what we think the upside is, we'll say, OK, we're you know, we're willing to to bet on our being able to help you and we want to share in the ups. 
So it's 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 sort of all over the place in that regard. But normally, normally restructuring firms, it's really the the core is you know uh, billable by the hour. That's where it starts. Sounds like that could be extremely lucrative. Well, it can, well it can. All right, it can be uh, uh, the you know and uh, but it also not it's not always uh, it, you know it depends too on 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 whether the, the whether the company is really it embraces your your um uh your your assistance right there's some companies where we see opportunities to improve their business and they're very entrenched and they don't want to do it they don't want to change you know and i always say if you if you're if you're having difficulties all right if you're really having difficulties then you know the, the management always feels oh all we have to do is do what we're doing better and we'll be okay but the answer really is, is that no, you've got to start doing things differently. All right. Because what you're doing hasn't worked. So you have to be, you have to be open to, you know, new approaches, and, you know, et cetera. And also for retailers today, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, technology, of course, technology has changed everything, but there are, are technology platforms and tools that retailers can uh, avail themselves with that are not that expensive to implement that have great ROI. And they have to be open, retailers and, you know, companies in general have to be open to that, right? Because that's that's changing how you do business, right? But, uh, but, but it can have tremendous effect. Like one of the things that I've done in a couple of companies um, immediately is, especially if, well, it covers actually all gamuts, but if you've got a, a customer that's, you know, lower middle income and lower income custom, uh, customers who have difficulty accessing credit, uh, one of the things that, that gives you an immediate boost is if you, if you put in, uh, one of the buy now, pay later companies like Klarna or Afterpay, et cetera, because what it does is it gives the customers access to more credit, right? And it's linked to their debit card. So they're off, they're score, they're, the, those companies, they're scoring the customer to make sure they can repay, but they're also giving that customer the ability to, uh, to purchase more and they pay it off over, you know, four weeks or eight weeks or something like that. And I've been in a couple of companies where it's, it's an immediate bump in revenues. And it also sort of ties the customer, customers like it and they like, and they like shopping with companies that offer that in that regard. So that's an easy, you know, it, it, that that's that's something, and and you know, it's it's become a very very popular um, methodology in, in companies of almost you know any um, uh, serving other income level people as well. So it's an example of something like that. You know, what was the most important thing that you've learned so far in life? <laughs> you mean about business? <laughs> well, the most important thing, Anything. the most important thing is really, and it's going to sound hackneyed, but it's all about the people. Okay. Because if you can't get the, if you can't get the right people in place to, 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 to build your organization, you're never going to be able to make it happen. And the other thing too is don't be afraid to make a change. All right. One of the, one of the things I've, run a lot of private equity conferences. And one of the questions we always ask the, the private equity people um, uh, on the panel is, you know, if you had to do something differently, what would it be? And they say, we would have made personnel changes sooner. And, you know, you got to be willing to do it, right? I mean, you don't want to, but you've got to evaluate and say, you know, can these people make it happen or not? And if and And what you find is if you... Let's say you have a, it's, it's so, uh, if you, if you put the right person in place, all right, it's amazing how quickly things can change. And it's a perfect example for retailers is the store managers, all right, is that you might have a store that's in a good location and it's not performing and you know the store manager needs to be replaced and you bring in a new store manager and who's really, you know, knows what they're doing. It's almost instantaneous how the business changes. So, so it's really, to me, it's, it's, it's really, it's really about assembling the right team and not being afraid to make the changes you need to make that happen. 